a phlebotomist at the VA hospital entered a patient's room to draw blood. Noticing an apple on the patient's nightstand, she said, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? And the patient responded, yeah, it sure does. I haven't seen one for three days. <laughs> the next few are just very short quotes about medical things from famous people. Never under any circumstances take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. Dave Barry. My doctor recently told me that jogging could add years to my life. I think he was right. I feel 10 years older already. <laughs> Milton Berle. And last, if your doctor's last name is Google, it's time to get a second opinion. <laughs> Anonymous. So since today's lesson is on a biblical perspective of illness, I just thought it was good to start out with the very biblical principle that laughter is good medicine. So you've had your laugh for the day, or the first of many, I hope, for the day. In past lessons, I've attempted to teach a number of biblical principles on health. And two of those were that I taught you that the path of life is peace, and that out of the heart flows life. But we all know that there are many causes of illness and that even someone who is joyful can find themselves laid up in bed with the flu, right? So today we're going to consider the causes of illness and in doing so, I hope to further your biblical perspective of what the Bible truly says about matters of health and how to walk the biblical path of life. The first category, I've grouped all of the causes of illness into three categories. The first category is just simply the result of living in a sin-cursed world. This is everything within the physical realm. Bacteria, nutrition, or lack thereof, addictions, our genetics, exercise, old age, injury, viruses. These are all things that are in the physical realm that are re the result of the curse from the Garden of Eden. So these are things that we all have to deal with whether your heart is at peace or whether or not you're the most miserable, grumpy person on the planet, everybody is going to have to deal in some way or another with the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world. Another reality is old age. So all of these things are what we typically think of when we think of health. We think if we do this and we don't do that, then we'll be healthy. So, for example, if I eat the right foods, whatever the right foods happen to be at that point in time, then I will be healthy. If I exercise in the right way, in the right amount, then I will be healthy. So we all often think of this category of health as being the primary one and that it's very black and white. If I do this, I don't do that, etc. I want to point out that... When illnesses are short-lived, physical causes of illness are short-lived, then it's pretty much a given that, yes, that is simply an illness that is the result of living in a sin-cursed world. However, when that illness turns into a long-term chronic condition, then it's time to start thinking about the other categories of illness that we want to look at. I used to substitute I was, my degrees in elementary education, and I was substituting while my son was attending a private school, and I used to get called in all the time for this one particular young woman who was a coach. She did gym classes for the elementary school, and I mean, I was in there all the time for her. 
And after I'd gone many times, there were two other coaches that worked with her that were both men. And being typical men, they were not the healthiest eating people. And so they told me one time, they were both laughing about it, and they're like, you know, this woman you sub for all the time, she is the biggest health nut we've ever known. She eats everything, you know, that's right. He said, and she's sick all the time. He said, we eat the, big, the most junk there ever was, and we're never sick. And, you know, so I've seen that same thing before. Maybe even some of you have dealt with that frustration of, you know, there seems to be something more at play than just simply this physical realm of what we eat. When I was sick chronically for all those years, the last few years of it, when it really got bad, I zeroed in on nutrition, and I, I mean, I could talk with the best of them of all the ins and outs of nutrition, and I began eating accordingly. And it became very apparent that the problem was not what I was eating, it was that my body wasn't assimilating all that wonderful nutrition, that there was something interfering with that physical realm, and I didn't know what it was, but something was going on, and I see this a lot with people who come to me and talk to me about their health issues. And so there's clearly more than just the physical realm that affects illness. There's one area here that I want to talk about just in brief, and that's aging. Because I've heard it said that all illness that results in death is the cause of sin. I've heard this taught. And I want to address that because we are going to be talking about the category of illness that is spiritual in nature. And I want to just stipulate a biblical perspective on aging to make sure that there's no misunderstanding here. And I want to look at a passage in Ecclesiastes tw chapter 12. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but it is Solomon being very metaphorical in talking about the deterioration that comes in the progression of age. And so I'm going to read it out loud. I'm using the New Living Translation, which I don't usually do, but it helps to show the metaphor a little more clearly without me having to stop and explain it as we go. So don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants, stop grinding. And before your eyes, the women looking through the windows, see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds, but then all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper and the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. I have no idea what the caperberry is, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. From that, we clearly see that Solomon is depicting the normal deterioration that living in this sin-cursed world that we all will face. And so it is not, he's not saying that these things happen because you are sinning and God is disciplining you for your sin. It is simply that this is the normal progression. There's one other quick verse that you may be familiar with. 
Psalm 90 verse 10 says, The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. So even though this may be obvious to most of you, I just wanted to stipulate to this before we go into the spiritual causes of illness so that that disclaimer has already been made. We're told that King David went through the normal progression of old age in 1 Kings 1.1, that he deteriorated over time before he finally went to be with the Lord. Yet Moses, who died at 120, we're told in Deuteronomy 34.7, still had his full eyesight and strength and vigor. Elisha, on the other hand, died after suffering, it says, from an illness. And that's in 2 Kings 13, 14. So God can intervene. He can change or alter the normal biological processes as he chooses and for different reasons. But the norm is a general deterioration till we go to be with the Lord. Now certainly the way that we care for our temple, meaning the body, the state of our heart, our soul and our spirit, And walking in sin is going to have an impact on how we age, but it isn't necessarily a one-for-one correlation. The second category of illness we've talked a lot about, and that is a heart that lacks peace with self, others, or God. This is the one, everything related to the heart that causes a lack of peace. So your thoughts and emotions This could also be a problem with your walk with the Lord where you walk in fear and you have a struggle um, trusting God. So all of these things are heart issues and they have a huge impact as we've learned in past lessons on our health. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And here's the verse that tells you why you need to laugh as much as possible. A joyful heart is a cure, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Proverbs 17:22. Laughter truly is good medicine. It's not just according to the Bible though, medicine, it's a cure. Okay, so the third category of illness would be spiritual causes. And there are a number of different reasons that there might be spiritual causes to illness. And I want to just highlight a couple of these before going into greater depth on the issue of sin. So it could be that um, there's demonic oppression or possession that is causing illness. In the story of Job, we're told that Job was tested by Satan or God allowed Satan to test Job and inflict him with a number of trials as well as illness being one of them. This was not because Job was so sinful that he was being disciplined. It was because he was so righteous that God was allowing him to be tested. Also, demon possession is seen a great deal in scripture and the physical impact that that has. This example from Matthew 17, 18 talks about a boy who was demon possessed and had a seizure disorder as a result. Now, another spiritual cause of illness could be to bring about some good purpose. And I want to clarify, this is not so much a cause of illness In other words, not that God causes someone to be ill to bring about a good purpose, but instead, we're familiar with Romans 8.28, which says, anybody that can quote it with me, go ahead. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So just as in any bad thing that comes into our lives, God can bring good out of it if his children love him and are looking to him. And so illness is the same thing. 
Paul said that, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Galatians 4, 13 and 14. So in other words, Paul had some sort of illness that came on him. And as a result, that changed his plans. And he ended up with a group of people that he, the Galatians, that he was able to share the gospel with and teach them as a result of God bringing good out of that illness, whatever it was that Paul had. This next spiritual cause is actually tied to the fact that God might bring about some good purpose, and that is that God might be glorified through the healing of the disease. And this we see in John 9, verses 2 and 3, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So God was intending to glorify himself through, not through the illness, but through the healing of that illness. And so that's an important thing that, you know, there are times that God, the good that God will bring out of something is that he is going to show himself mighty when that individual is healed from that disease. And that's what we see in this example. I do want to point out, though, that the fact that the disciples asked the question, where did that come from? What caused them to think that, the man had sinned or his parents had sinned well it's because there is a lot of teaching in the bible that talks about that and that jesus himself talked about it in front of the disciples so it's an area that we need to address as well but in this example it is a very blatant firm thing we can stand on that without a doubt, not every illness has a spiritual root. Not every illness is because of sin. And we see that in this example and in the example of Job. Now, in order to move into the, the more uncomfortable teaching on when sin is the cause of illness, I want to start by sharing with you more of my own story. After God healed me of all my hormone-related conditions, my back pain, my fibromyalgia, and hypothyroidism, there was one significant problem area that still remained, and that was I seemed to be allergic to everything. At this point, I had not studied the Bible on health. All of the healing that God had brought about was the result of me not studying about health, but studying about the love of God. And so as God healed me through his word and changed my my relationship with him, that was how God brought about healing of all those other things. But I had not made that connection yet. I didn't understand what had transpired. And it was at that point that a close friend of mine gave me this huge book. And it was all on the spiritual roots of illness. The implication was that almost all illness is spiritually rooted. And so my friend gives me this, and I was, I'll be honest, I was really offended. I mean, how dare she insinuate that the last 20 years of my incredible suffering was the result of some sin in my life? I was just, I was very put off, to say the least. And I was not disrespectful to her, unkind to her, but I just quietly took the book, I stuck it on a shelf, and I'm like, I am not thinking about that. I want nothing to do with that. I was so upset. However, God was at work in me, and he wouldn't let the thought out of my mind that perhaps there is some truth in this, and maybe my friend who truly loves me had a reason to risk offending me so deeply because she had something that the Lord had prompted her to do in giving me that book. So one Saturday morning when my whole family was still asleep and I had woken up quite early, I thought, okay, Lord, I'll check out this book. 
And so I started to read, and the author used all these scriptures, and I thought, well, surely he's taking these scriptures out of context. So I went back to the Bible itself, and I began looking up, and not just reading the verses he would quote, but large sections. And I thought, well, this is silly. I'm just going to start in Genesis and read through the entire Bible and highlight, as I've told you before, all of the passages on health and illness. And so I became quite obsessed with this and trying to get an answer, pleading with the Lord, is there really a spiritual root to my illness? Do you still discipline your children for sin in their lives using illness in particular? And so as I'm reading through, I came to the book of Jeremiah. And the book of Jeremiah talks a lot about God using illness as a form of discipline. And, but, you know, that's all safe. It wasn't too pointed to me, I didn't feel like. But then I came to Jeremiah chapter 15, and it's a private conversation between Jeremiah and God. And I related as I read the verses. Verses 15 through 17, Jeremiah says, Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. So I read those verses and I thought, huh, yeah, that's me. I've lived righteously. Yeah, go Jeremiah. Woo! <laughs> So then I read verse 18. Jeremiah says, Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that never fails. And I thought, yes, that's right. Go, Jeremiah, I'm with you. And I'm thinking, you know, I, Lord, I've walked righteously with you. Why have you allowed my pain to be unending, my wounds to be grievous? It's like you're deceiving me, God. Why are you doing this? So here, you know, I'm really into this. And the Holy Spirit's really got my attention. And then I come to verse 19. I didn't like verse 19. It says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent... I will restore you that you may serve me. Oh my goodness. It was like God just, it was, he was speaking to me. It was not Jeremiah. He was saying, Marcy, you have lived righteously, but because of that, you have become self-righteous. You are so proud of your righteousness. You are critical of others. You are judgmental of others, and that is an abomination to me. And for the first time, God just struck me with my need for repentance about my self-righteousness. And I wept before the Lord, and I confessed my sin, and I repented. And afterward, I was ready to receive what God had to say in his word about the connection between sin and illness. And so I share this with you out of a very humble heart, not as one who is saying, you know, pointing the finger at anyone, but instead that God's word needs to be taught and it needs to be heard and Nobody is teaching about it. We live in a culture where it is very offensive to talk about sin and where we're supposed to tolerate sin. I recognize that that's the case as I go into these passages that we're going to look at. But I just ask you to let God's word speak to you how it will. You know, not saying that anything is other than just between you and the Lord, and to see what God might have to say to you today. Let's go ahead and talk about something from the book of Deuteronomy that is from Deuteronomy 28 through 30, and it's the covenant of blessings and curses. You know, it's funny how much effort we'll go through to explain away things that we don't want to 
accept as true. And this was certainly the case with me regarding the biblical connection between sin and illness. I didn't want to accept it. And when I was reading through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, very rapidly, I came across the covenant of blessings and curses, which God gave to Moses to give to the Israelites before they entered the promised land. It's basically saying that if you follow my law, the words of my law, then I will bless you. If you don't, and I'll bless you in every conceivable way you could possibly imagine. But if you don't, then I will curse you in every conceivable way that you can imagine. And one of those, a significant one of those that he talks at great length on, is the idea of illness. Deuteronomy 28, 58, and 61. So if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, the Lord will send every kind of sickness. So we're going to read through the sections of this covenant of blessings and curses that talk about illness and the illnesses that God said he would bring on his people, the Israelites, if they didn't follow his law. And I'll start throughout chapters 28 and 30. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation until you perish. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors, festering sores, and the itch from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. The Lord will afflict your knees and legs with painful boils of which you cannot be cured, spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. If you do not carefully follow all the words of this law which are written in this book and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring on you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded and they will cling to you. The Lord will also bring on you every kind of sickness and disaster not recorded in the book of the law until you are destroyed. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both night and day, never sure of your life. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening, and in the evening, if only it were morning. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham Isaac and Jacob and all those verses the references are in your notes as well I'm sure you agree that that is really harsh and after reading though the many types of illnesses that are described in areas of the body that God could inflict with physical suffering because of sin we have to call into question the idea that so much of health just centers in the physical realm. Clearly God has a great impact on health because it talks about everything from bacteria to viruses to cancer to psychological disorders and so on. I don't know if you noticed it also referenced and I highlighted them in yellow that these illnesses would be lingering, they would be chronic, they would be prolonged, that they would not be able to be healed. Why is that? Well, it was because if the illness was the result, which this is saying it would be, because of sin, until they repent, God would not bring healing. So the big question is, did the use of illness to bring God's children to repentance only hold true under the covenant of the law. 
because according to Luke 4, 19 through 21, we are no longer under the covenant of the law, right? We are under the covenant of grace because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. So Jesus died in our place, and if we have put our trust in him, then he suffered the wrath of God in our place so that we are no longer under condemnation. We are no longer under the curse of God. And so that's great. That's fantastic for us. The question, though, is, does that completely negate God using illness as a form of discipline for his children, or is that carried over into the New Testament? So we need to figure that out. Before we go into the New Testament, though, I just want to show you a couple passages that indicate that sin is directly linked in the Old Testament to many symptoms and conditions. There are a multitude of passages that talk about the connection of sin and illness. The reason the disciples ask that question about who sinned, this man or his parents, is because the Old Testament is absolutely chock full of indications that God uses illness as a form of discipline to bring his children to repentance. I don't want to use the word of God as a club. I don't want to belabor the point. So I'm not going, I only put four references in your notes of some of the many passages that there are. And we're just going to read two of them. One is Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. So this first verse here, David is saying, this is the blessing that we have, the forgiveness of sins and not being held by the effects of guilt. However, then he goes on to say, when I kept silent, meaning I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So here David's saying, we have this promise of forgiveness of sin and not being disciplined for our sin, but I chose not to listen to that, and I chose to hold on to my sin, but when I finally confessed it and turned to the Lord, you forgave the guilt of my sin. It's a powerful reminder of God's desire to lovingly draw his children to repentance. And then one last scripture is Jeremiah 9-7 from the Old Testament. Jeremiah says, Therefore this is what the Lord Almighty says, See, I will refine and test them for what else can I do because of the sin of my people. We don't get the sense from that verse that God is saying, I'm going to punish them because they're bad. But instead, what can I do? I love my children. I want them to walk with me and to know the fellowship of walking with me. But they keep walking in sin. So what do I do? I have to refine them. So that's the heart of God. That Even though in the Old Testament we see this, what seems to be harsh, there is this love behind God's use of illness. So let's look at the New Testament to establish our biblical principle of health, which is illness is often a tool of discipline by a loving Heavenly Father to sanctify his children. And I want to go through quickly what the New Testament talks about regarding connecting sin and illness. Jesus himself connected sin and illness in a number of ways. When Jesus healed people, he often said, your sins are forgiven. Rather than saying, you are healed, he said, your sins are forgiven. So he was making that connection between sin and illness when he brought about healing. Jesus also said to one man, uh, after he healed one man, he said, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. John 5.14 
So apparently Jesus had healed this man and then he ran into him later and maybe this man was doing something that was sinful and Jesus says, hey buddy, you better stop or something worse may happen. So a very pointed indication that Jesus was connecting the discipline for sin with illness. Another indication in the New Testament that is very clear that indicates that God still uses illness as a form of discipline for his children, and that is related to communion. So many are sick and die because of taking communion wrong. And this is in 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 31. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, meaning died. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. So God is saying that there are many Christians who are sick and have died simply because they didn't judge themselves and then they took communion. That's a very clear indicator that God does indeed still use illness as a tool to discipline his children for the purpose of bringing us back into fellowship with himself. Now we talked about the covenant of blessings and curses. And this next passage, I will admit when I first encountered it, I was not happy about it because it makes a direct tie back to the covenant of blessings and curses and God's use of illness. Paul actually warns believers of illness using examples from the time of the covenant of blessings and curses. And the passage is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 12. It says, now these things occurred as examples. Keep that phrase in mind. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And now he's going to refer back to the Old Testament. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down, why? As warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 12. That's a pretty direct and powerful warning that Paul gives. In there, he talks about three different instances that were during the time of the Israelites after they had been given the covenant of blessings and curses. The first one was the golden calf, which refers back to Exodus 32, verses 4 through 6 and 35. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because what they did with the calf Aaron had made. The second warning Paul gives refers to Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And he says, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. The third warning he gives refers to Numbers chapter 14, verses 4 through 9. And verse 37 says, These men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. And then we're told that following the 12 spies being killed by a plague, that all of those over 20 years of age we're going to die untimely deaths before God would take the Israelites into the promised land. So, I don't know. I don't see any way around this. Paul makes it pretty clear that the use of illness as a form of discipline for God's children that is talked about in the Old Testament is clearly carried over in the New Testament. So what do we do with this teaching? I know what my response was, and 
Mine was that, okay, God, if all of these allergies that I'm dealing with are the result of sin in my life, you know, I wasn't aware of my own self-righteousness and my judgmental and critical spirit. Lord, if there's anything else, search my heart and show it to me because I want to walk rightly with you. And so for three weeks, I prayed, you know, because the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And that's the truth. I didn't recognize my own sin in my heart. I was blind to it. So I began to pray, Lord, if there is sin in my heart, please search me and show it to me so I can repent. And for three weeks, I prayed that every day and God faithfully showed me far more than I wanted to see. And I repented, and at the end of that three weeks, I asked the Lord, okay, God, if that's it, <laughs> you know, if, I, if that's it, Lord, will you heal me? And he did, of all my allergies. So I'll talk more about that at a, in a later lesson in greater detail, but I just share this with you because if there is illness that is the result of God's discipline in someone's life, there is healing with repentance. And that is my heart's desire, and that is the Lord's desire. As we've said, the New Testament clearly shows that God uses illness as a disciplinary tool to bring his children to repentance. There are two passages that are in your notes. One is Hebrews 12 that talks at great length about the discipline of God for his children and that this is discipline we're not to despise. It actually refers back to what I had you read in your small groups at the beginning of our lesson. This is why I had you do it, because Hebrews 12 quotes Proverbs 3. And Proverbs 3 and 4 that you read, it's talking about this path of life. Solomon is saying, son, there is this path of life, and to walk on it, you need God's wisdom and understanding. Seek after that wisdom and understanding, and then your heart will give life to your body. Avoid the sin, follow the Lord. That's the path of life. And so it is that context that we need to know from Proverbs 3 and 4 that is quoted in Hebrews 12 when it says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebu rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. As his son. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So this is the heart of the Lord, not to bring suffering and misery to his children's lives so that they might come to walk in the blessings of fellowship with God. Another passage that I'm not going to take the time to read, but is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. And it also speaks of God using discipline to sanctify his children. Now, if an illness is due to God's discipline for sin, as I've hinted before in the lesson spoke of, repentance brings healing. And next week's lesson, please don't miss next week. We're going to look at healing throughout the Bible. And we're going to talk more in depth about this promise in God's word that repentance brings healing. We see two verses, one in Jeremiah, the Old Testament verse, and it's mirrored in Acts 3.19. So we have the Old Testament carried over to the New again with this promise of healing. Jeremiah 15, 19 says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. Acts 3, 19 mirrors that and says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. A wonderful promise that we can look forward to. Okay, so I want to close summarizing all that we've learned about causes of illness. And to do this, I've created some charts. And you have these charts in your notes, but they're up on the screen as well. I want to compare a biblical perspective of health with the common perspective of health. If we were looking at our health as a pyramid, 
People commonly think that the physical, diet, exercise, genetics, germs, all the in the physical realm plays the largest role in determining our health. Now most people are not even, it's not even on their radar that the heart has any impact on health. Now you guys are on top of things because we've studied it in here and looked at how the heart has such a tremendous impact on the health of our bodies. But most people would still put that as secondary to all of the physical realm. And then the third, if you're a Christian, then often the common view of health is that God is overarching all of it, but he's not directly controlling or impacting the physical realm. Instead, God as the great physician, he's our healer, and if it's his will and we ask him, and we ask with faith, then he'll heal us. And so God is seen more above, but not directly impacting health. But what we've seen in our lesson today and in previous lessons is a very different picture of health. And that is that God and the spirit realm is the undergirding, the foundation of our health. And so it's not that he's up at the top overseen and unconnected. He is our foundation for health. The second area we've seen is that the heart, our spirit and soul, is clearly very significant in impacting our health, even more so than the physical realm. And the physical realm is the smallest of all categories that impacts the health of our bodies. Completely different than what is commonly thought of and understood about health. And as a result of the common perspective, when people are sick, they only tend to focus on the physical. And yet when you understand a biblical perspective of health, you realize that what we need to instead do not that we neglect the physical, don't think I'm saying that, but that we need to focus on the Lord. We need to seek Him, to seek, is there sin in our lives that is the result of this? Is this testing from God? And it's not because I'm walking sinfully, but because I've been walking righteously, but God will be faithful in it, and He'll sustain me through this. When our walk with the Lord is hindered from sin or from any number of things, then we begin to have that foundation eroded, which causes our heart to struggle, which causes the physical to be impacted. And so our immune system doesn't work as well, our uh, whatever it is, you, you know, you name it. We learned about all those different impacts that the heart can have on the physical. So... When we think about health, we want to remember that if you truly want to be healthy, then seek to be in fellowship with the Lord above all. Spend less time on Google researching every possibility of, of illness and what you can do and pursue and so on. Again, I'm not saying to neglect the physical, but I'm saying change your focus from that to your walk with the Lord and seek him. And I'm not going to take the time to read it, but last reference in your notes is Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. And it again talks about all of what we've just learned. It, it portrays that the path of life is the Lord and seeking him, not sin.